sing, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high, to see you high and lifted up. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of glory. Please pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. for us this morning is that we would as metaphorical as it is open the eyes of our heart that we would be listening that we would be yearning and, and earnest to hear from the Lord this morning I love you Lord for your mercy never fails me and all my days are in held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the good things of God sing all my life you have been faithful it's all my life you have been it's all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice.
your goodness. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. I'm not laid down, surrender now. I give everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's see your goodness. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm so bent now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. I'll be starting off with some scripture. I'll be reading through Matthew, Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, Megan. So we're in week two of our series back in the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, If you weren't here last week, chapter eight is where we are situated currently. And it is following this beautiful journey that the writer has been taking us through. Chapters 5 through 7 see the Sermon on the Mount proclaimed in this manifesto of what Jesus calls the kingdom of God that's breaking into the world, not simply in word, but in the very person of Jesus. Now here in chapter 8, the words of Jesus don't simply remain on the hillside, but they make their way into the streets into the small towns that litter the the Sea of Galilee and beyond, where the words of Jesus come to life in the actions and the life of Jesus. If you have spent any time in church, this is a chapter with a number of stories that you will be highly familiar with. Whether it was last week and the, the man with the skin condition, this week with the centurion and his servant who is paralyzed, Uh, Upcoming weeks, we find a a ship at sea or a a boat caught in a storm. All familiar stories. And the reason I want to note this is often familiarity can be a real detriment in our experience of the Scripture. If we really feel like we already have heard the text, know the text, we don't open ourselves up to the possibility of fresh revelation within it. And I'm not saying it because I'm preaching it. I'm saying it because the Word is alive with the Spirit of God meant to do something within us at every interaction, at every junction that we come into encounter with it. So my invitation to you as we engage with this perhaps familiar story, don't tune out. Instead, open yourself up 
and ask, Spirit of God, what might you have for me this morning from the story that I perhaps heard in Sunday school 20 times over? So I, I believe there is a fresh revelation, and I think we're going to find it today. So let's pray. Father, we invite you to, to do something new inside of us. Thank you for stories like this that are meant to draw our hearts to remember who you are. Thank you for pictures like a centurion that we don't know a name, but we see the, the heart of faith that he has. And we ask, as your people, as those who are gathering today, if we, if we are feeling close to you, if we're feeling far from you, thank you that you are always near to us. That you are taking that step. That you draw close to us. And I just pray that our hearts would be softened today. Our minds would be opened. And that our spirit would be one that encounters yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title for today's talk is, What is Faith? Stories of profound faith are iconic in human history. And these are individuals who have maybe this immense faith that carry this profound conviction often at a great cost to themselves. We don't have to look too far in history to see what faith does in an individual that compels them to action. Whether it's Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, whether you see Joan of Arc, St. Francis of Assisi, you can even look at the disciples, someone like Peter or the Apostle Paul. There was faith around something that became a conviction upon which they lived their life. All these significant characters in history whose accounts and stories we quote and we talk about with this like sense of awe today. Because I think deep down, whether or not you name it, we have a fascination with faith. We love the idea of believing something so wholeheartedly that you're going to put down everything and pursue it. We love that idea. We love stories of faith. We love its dramatic and beautiful nature to it. There, there's quotes that are, are beautiful and dramatic that kind of capture our imagination. Barbara Johnson says, Faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes see is darkness. And we certainly feel this. Sometimes gathering on a Sunday can perhaps be a, a glimmer of light in the darkness that we experience on a week-to-week -week basis. And how much more do we long for a faith in which God interrupts the darkness of our week with light more than a Sunday morning, not more than a community group gathering, but just in our very existence as followers of Jesus. We long for that. I know I long for that. That type of faith that sticks with us in every moment, that, that breaks through. We are in awe of faith at work and Jesus is as well. Within this story, it says Jesus was amazed in light of the centurion's faith. All this is true, I believe, yet I think we all experience the reality that faith can be extremely fleeting. It can be fickle. It can fall away far too easily. It's a lot of Fs. Here in Matthew 8 we find Jesus approached by a centurion. And there's some things that I think we can learn about the centurion's faith that can be relevant for ours. But let's, let's understand, a centurion is not like a normal class, like you're not saying to someone, like, what do you do for your, for your work? And you tell them a centurion, and you immediately know what that means. Uh, a centurion in the Roman army was a professional officer who often held authority for what would be a century, about 880 to 100 uh, different soldiers. It was a man who held uh, authority, someone who held a ton of influence in the army itself, but also in the community around it. He would have been an influential figure within the, the surrounding area. And we find him in this story coming to Jesus. This is, this is not uh, a Jewish individual or even someone like Nicodemus that we might, that we'll end up approaching later on in, in a different story. This is someone that is outside of what would have been perceived the regular circle of God's people. And he comes with this faith that Jesus says is more than he has seen in all of Israel. 
The centurion approaches Jesus. He acknowledges Jesus' his authority. He expresses his faith that Jesus only needs to speak a word and the healing would happen. And amazed by the centurion's faith, the healing does take place. And it highlights the surpassing faith of his in, in the face of the other people around him, in the face of the, the children of Israel. And the servant is healed. And it's so easy to just be like, wow, he's got amazing faith. That's not the kind of faith that I have. Maybe, maybe I'll get there one day. And it's worth noting, there's a couple of verses toward the end that you might have read or noticed when we were reading them out loud. And be like, what, what does that mean? We'll, we'll talk about that ever so slightly. Uh, but I don't want to distract from the heart of the passage, which is focus on this idea of faith. We may not have a paralyzed servant at home that we're believing for healing. But we are certainly holding on to significant requests in our hearts that we wish to be fulfilled. We know that posture of the centurion longing for Jesus to intervene. We have all been there. If not, we're all there currently in one form of an, or another. And we know that faith is easier said than done. And sometimes, hearing a story like this can swing, uh, swing our attention to this fervor and excitement of, okay, God can do it, I'm going to lean in, I'm going to have faith. Or it can go the other way and it can lead us down this spiral of distraction and despair of, well, it's just not going to happen for me. Today, I'm going to explore the faith of the centurion and how his faith can be a model for our faith today. So we ask the question, what is faith? Our language around it can be really varied, but very simply, let's lay at the, at the foundation of it, faith is trust. Trust has to exist for faith to really take place. Faith in our language can be a verb, it can be a noun, it can be misconstrued. But trust, I think we, we get trust. We like the word trust. Trust is something that we seek to earn. It's something that we hope to give. It's something that we find is something we want for someone to feel towards us. We want to give it towards others. Trust is deeply human. It's deeply relational. Trust is so intertwined with who Jesus is. And perhaps more effectively than the word faith, it actually draws us into the conversation of biblical faith and the way of Jesus. Trust is a word that we get. The phrase, perhaps you've heard it said, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. I think it can do a lot of good things in pushing back against the type of posture in our faith that wants to make us do X, Y, Z in order to enter the pearly gates. Like that's just not the posture of Jesus. But a word like trust, I think, draws us closer to what Jesus actually desires. That he wants that relationship. He wants that familiarity. He wants that nearness to us. Through the story of the centurion, we get a picture of what trust really looks like. That trust it is almost in like three forms in this story. It's remembering, it's humility, and it's action. Now, by no means am I proposing a mass edit of the Bible to swap all faith words with trust. Faith is an important idea, and it is one that is a primary one within the text. But for our purposes this morning, trust is the focus, and trust is the thing that I believe moves our faith from our head to our hearts. But let's be clear, uh, it does start with our head. There is this notion when it comes to Christianity and when it comes to faith in general that somehow, or religion, it's blind. That it's blind faith. And let me say, that is a cultural perception, not a biblical idea. Blind faith is not what it is described at in the Bible. In everything we do, there is nothing that we have 100% knowledge of. 
And it is extremely arrogant for us to perceive that to be the case in whatever category. To believe that we have 100% knowledge of something is just untrue. And the cases, it's, it's similar within our faith. There is mystery involved. But there are reasons in which we find faith to be true and which make trust possible. And this is what the Bible actually leads us towards. So the first thought is trust is remembering. I had coffee with someone this week and we were talking about the challenges of actually believing the promises of God. Of actually hoping and thinking, well, God, if you are saying this, I, I should want this for myself. I should trust you with it. I should have my faith go in that direction. And their honest response to me was, I'm really bad at it. And, and my, my response in turn was, I am too. It's, it's really hard to have faith in the best of times, let alone when it's most difficult. Yet when we find this centurion, we see a man of great faith. So what propelled his, his actions, his, his life, his response to have a faith that responds to just the presence of Jesus. It wasn't even that Jesus said, hey, 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 look at me. Hey, by the way, I'm going to do exactly what you want me to do. It's not like Jesus sent out a, a giant mail list and said, hey, by the way, I'm coming into town. Hit me up if you want something. Simply, the story tells us that he knew that Jesus was coming by, that the presence of Jesus was, was entering their town, and his response was one of faith. What led him there? What made the centurion different? Well, based upon the passage at hand, I think he had a reason to believe this. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it can feel like these snapshots and when we look at a snapshot like this of faith, well, he just had a sudden stirring of faith that he responded in this dramatic way. And then bingo, bango, his servant that was paralyzed was now healed. I don't believe that to be the case. In fact, I think that there's a process that's shown to us. This same story that we see in Matthew chapter 8 shows up in Luke chapter 7. If you were to read the Gospels, you'll notice that Matthew chapter 8 in particular, follows the script of the writer and is often written to a Jewish audience. But when you look at the writer that is Luke, you find someone who loves to include detail. He wants to have the whole picture provided. So even something as simple, at the beginning of Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, there is a verse which indicates something slightly different than what we read in chapter 8. In chapter 8, it says the centurion approached Jesus. In Luke chapter 7, it says that elders of Israel approached Jesus on behalf of the centurion. Now, this is not meant to communicate error. This is meant to communicate detail. What was provided for us in the gospel of Luke is the simple fact. is not that the centurion just had a random experience of faith and responded. It was that he was in relationship with those who had heard and known about Jesus. In Luke chapter 7, it says, When they came to Jesus, this is the elders, on behalf of the centurion, they pleaded earnestly with him. And they said, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. So there was a clear relationship. He had built them a synagogue, and he was evidently a friend of the Jews, and he was likely a good man. For if you think about this, in that time and place, in that cultural climate, a little boy who was a servant would have been nothing more than property within the Roman context. So for him to have any type of empathy or discouragement or despair about the suffering of that which was deemed property in that time, it speaks of an individual who had a deep kindness in his heart that was different than the norm at the time. He didn't simply look at his servants as things, he saw them as people. And the fact that he was disturbed over his condition tells us about his heart. And then we see that the elders of Israel, they come on behalf of the centurion. And then as Jesus makes his way to see the centurion, a runner comes and stops him 
And the centurion says, you don't, I'm not worthy to have you in my house. But I know this, that even with just a word, the servant would be healed. What does that tell us? It tells us that he knew the power that Jesus had. He knew that there had been stories and moments, experiences in other people's lives that had begun to build trust that he knew who Jesus was and what he was capable of doing. Trust is remembering, it's hearing, it's experiencing the goodness of God in times that have come for others and for ourselves and seeing that be a muscle that's built in our experiences in the here and now. Here's the thing about trust. It's not a flick on the switch. I think we know that in our everyday relationships. It takes time to build trust. You have to have conversation. You gotta, got, sometimes got to go through some stuff. Do you ever notice that? That when you go through a difficult experience with a friend or with a family member and you get through on the other side, you notice that the relationship is deepened. Trust is, is tighter. The same goes in our relationship with God. That we need these moments where we remember that he was faithful to me once and he will be to me again. He showed up for me in the story once. He'll show up for me again. He made a way for me to find hope where I was hopeless. And so I will feel hope again. Even when despair is at my doorstep, I know that joy is possible because he has shown me that joy is who he is. We need to remember. Trust is remembering. And part of this trust that was built for the centurion was the simple fact that he had had people around him tell stories of who Jesus was. He knew of his power. So much so that he had this faith and trust that said, do not even worry about coming into my home. Just send a word and healing will follow. He, he knew who Jesus was. Remembering is foundational to trust. Remembering happens through lived experiences and stories told. He had come to know who Jesus was and what he did. C.S. Lewis says this, Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And you can insert uh, different words beyond moods, changing experience, changing actions, changing life. In spite of it, faith holds on to that thing of reason that captured your heart in the moment. It did begin in the head, and it began to move to your heart. Hebrews 11 verse 1 is perhaps the most famous faith chapter in the Bible, and it opens with the refrain that faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. So when we deal with the idea of faith within Christianity, and when you talk to others about it, blind faith is often something that comes to the forefront. You're just following a, a crutch. You're just dealing with an idea that you just have to have to get, get through the day. Or you're, you're just not even considering the details. You haven't reasoned this, else, this all out. Hebrews chapter 11 provides three different examples of, of great faith. And it's not blind faith, but it's faith that remembered. There's a story of Sarah that's provided for the, the reader. And it's indicating the, the moment in which Sarah's life, where she had God provide in an incredible way, and she had a child. And we always remember, remember Sarah as the one who laughed when God made the promise. That God, that, that God says, you're going to have a child, and la Sarah laughs. Well, that doesn't sound like faith. But within the story of Sarah, within Hebrews 11, it doesn't simply highlight the laugh, but it highlights her faith. It highlights the fact that she had seen God provide. Remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. That they, were, they went into a foreign land without anything, and God provided. They went into spaces of danger, and God protected that God had made promises to them throughout their life, and God had answered. And yes, she did not have complete confidence that it was for sure going to happen, but she certainly had a trust that God had done it once, perhaps he can do it again. There was a baseline for remembering that created a trust. 
what I've often found is faith takes time. And people who have gone through life and they've experienced some real struggle or some real heartache and they've come out on the other side and they continue to follow Jesus, it is fascinating to have conversations with them about faith. Because you have a conversation with them and you're almost expecting a response that is like reasoning out a situation based on past experience. But what I've found is that they have a peace to their trust that almost seems irrational. Often the sentiment is, well, I've seen God do it before. I trust him to do it again. And that takes us to our second idea, that trust is humility. The response of the centurion is one of incredible humility. Let's remember, he was one who held station and authority. And in a life where he held control over others, in fact, that was very much part of his identity, his heart of humility just demonstrated a trust in Jesus that actually procured amazement. And this is what I know for myself, and I think that as as a culture as a whole, we fall into this trap. We are simply daily curators of control. How much control can I garner for myself? We seek it out in all the different spaces that we're in. And more often than not, we prevent ourselves from holding real faith because we make ourselves the ones in control. We have been conditioned to believe that being in control is actually the best place to be. But what was Jesus actually saying about the humility of the centurion in these verses? Because the centurion sends the the servant out ahead to stop Jesus from coming. He says, just send a word and healing will take place. Jesus says, he was amazed. There's no greater faith that I've seen in all of Israel. And then he kind of goes in on Israel. So let's take a look at verses 11 and 12. It says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whenever you read gnashing of teeth in the Bible, it just doesn't feel good. It's tough. Now, What is Jesus talking about? It can be difficult to kind of grab hold of. But in a different translation, it uses the phrase sons of the kingdom. And sons of the kingdom is also just another piece of language for the nation of Israel. The Gospel of Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. So this highlighted idea from Jesus in response to the faith shown by the centurion is meant to demonstrate simply that the people of Israel had grown entitled in their faith. They had fallen into the trap of simply believing that their birthright provided all that they needed in order to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying, it is not your birthright, it is your faith. And and he's calling them out. When it says weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's often a phrase used to talk about hell in the Bible. And I want to focus more specifically on this idea of being thrown out, separated from the kingdom. That the idea of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the idea of hell, is separation from God. There's a whole lot of theology and language that we can dive into on that. But what I want to focus on is very simply... That Jesus was highlighting the faith of the centurion and pointing out the entitlement of Israel. Because they they had lost all humility. And when humility was lost, trust was lost. Trust is humility. We need it. So often... We lose that sense of trust in our life because we have moved from this place. You should have expectation. Healthy trust is I trust my my mom. And I know that when I go over, I have this expectation that she's going to have good things waiting for me. Whether it's it's a a meal, a hug, whatever. I I have this good expectation. We should have that in relationship with God. That's good trust. Entitlement is what it turns into when humility is lost. 
that I show up at home and I have this entitled attitude that my mom is going to do everything for me. This is the transition that becomes dangerous in our faith. When trust loses humility, our expectation becomes entitlement. And we become like the people of Israel who have lost real faith, who have lost real trust, and are simply depending on something that is not Jesus. And we fall outside of what his desires are for us. Life that lacks trust twists expectation into entitlement. And it it becomes this pride that builds up inside of us. John Gottman, who is a uh, relational counselor, he's a, a marriage counselor, he talks about this idea of trust. One of the things that I notice when it comes to trust and humility is humility isn't shown in the big moments. Humility is shown in the small moments. If there is a dramatically selfish moment, it is most likely just the pinnacle of a long path of small ones. Humility is often seen in the small moments. And Gottman says that trust is built in very small moments, which I call sliding door moments. And in any interaction, there is a possibility of connecting or turning away. And humility is the same. There's a possibility of real connection or self-absorption. Little moments require humility. Uh, Jordan, I'll have you ask. I'll have you pass me that chair. I was going to grab a different one, but if it's right there, great. Now, trust is an interesting thing. A chair is something to be sat on and to hold you. And if it's a well-built chair, if I know it to be a good chair, then it's going to do the trick. It's going to hold me if I sit on it. But a chair doesn't get to function in the way that it's meant to function unless I actually sit in it. (laughs) And there's part of it in our relationship with God where, where Jesus is this consistently faithful presence. That he's always going to hold us. He's always going to be present. He's always going to be stable. And yet, we don't really trust the chair to hold our full weight. And so maybe when we sit on it, we like have like one foot off, like we're kind of leaning off of it. Like, I'm going to put more weight on myself, and then we, like, tip the chair a little. Or, like, we kind of hold ourselves up. You're, like, doing this gymnastics thing off the side of it. When in reality, faith that is truly growing within us, faith that is trust, is believing that the chair will hold you when you sit on it. Little moments are these intentional moments where we learn to trust the chair. It's a process. Okay, I don't, I don't really know the chair fully. Uh, is, is it well constructed? Will it hold my full weight? Will it be able to be there when I sit down? And little moments are these moments where we kind of sit onto it a little carefully and we sit and we hold ourselves and we kind of hold onto the chair and we feel a little bit uncomfortable. Big moments are the culmination of those little, little moments. It's like when you come home from work and it's been a long day and you've got that couch in your house. That really comfy couch. You know it's going to feel good. You know it's going to hold you. And you don't think twice about it. You fall into it. That's trust. You've built a relationship. There there is a complete giving yourself over, body, soul, mind, fully into that couch. And you know it's going to comfort you. It's going to hold you. It's going to sustain you in that moment. And you're going to sit in it. But when you first buy a couch, what do you do? You sit a little carefully on it. You're testing, ah, is this actually the one for me? Am I actually going to be, going to actually enjoy this? Maybe you're crazy and you just jump on the couch, you trust it right away. That's not me. When you often engage with something like this, you, t- you get used to it at first. You build the trust. But when the trust is built, built you can put your full weight on it. But what is sitting if not a relinquishment of, the, of your control to hold yourself up? Requires humility. And number three, just like we talked about, if the chair is doing all that it's supposed to do, if the chair is faithful, if God is faithful, the chair 
doesn't actually operate fully in its function until you sit in it. Faith is, or trust is, action. It's not just mental assent. It's not just thinking that's a good idea. It is actually moving upon the faith that you hold. The centurion had heard stories. The centurion humbled his heart, but he still had to send word to Jesus. He still had to act upon the faith that had built up inside of him. His mental assent to the person of Jesus had to translate to meaningful action. He had to sit in the chair. He had to relinquish control of holding himself up and sit where he believed God to be faithful. And when he did so, he found a chair that sustained every hope that he had in that moment and went up and above and beyond and provided healing for his servant who was paralyzed. Our English word for faith often is around the idea of something that happens in our heads, and we liken it to mental activity, but it's more than that. It's, it's a choice. It's an action. Christian faith might begin with reason, but it's completed with action. Think of it this way. That if there is a fire in a building and in the upper room of a house and all the people are gathered out on the street, suddenly a child appears on the second story and then a crowd sees them. There's this great big fella that comes to the, to the edge and he says, jump, I'm going to catch you. Let's say that he, he plays for the BC Lions. It's a big dude. And he goes over, and as the crowd shouts for the child to jump, this huge man stands out. He's six foot seven, he weighs 225 pounds, and he really holds the moment. And he holds up his arms and he says, Jump, jump, I'll catch you. Part of faith is knowing that the man is there. That's the mental ascent. Knowing that the man is there. But faith has to be completed. In the trust of actually jumping. Martin Luther King Jr. says that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Faith is action. Trust is action. Worship team, you can join me at the front. What might action look like? This is always the question. The centurion's faith had him send word ahead to Jesus so that Jesus would simply heal his servant. What might trust, what might faith look like for us? Well, we could be contributors to remembering for those around us, the building of trust. We can do that by sharing our testimony. When are moments in your story where God has shown up and provided? Maybe it's very simply following the way of Jesus and living a life well lived so that you're declaring who Jesus is by your day-to-day -day actions. Maybe it's a commitment of your focus. There's practice to be in the presence of God on a daily basis that is transforming you from the inside out. And perhaps in all of that, it's response in the midst of our struggle. I find more often than not that people are surprised when they find someone who has peace in the midst of a difficult moment. And often when that peace comes about, it's because there's a trust, there's a faith in something that's beyond them, themselves. I want you to hear what is taking place within that centurion. He's remembering, he's humbling himself, and he's acting. And at the very beginning of remembering humbling himself and acting at the very beginning of it is what we all have and it's a request of need. He, he wants to see a healing take place for his paralyzed servant. What is the request that's on your heart today that you feel like you do not have the faith for? That you don't feel like you built the trust for? And in fact, this request feels incredibly heavy. The beauty of faith and the beauty that we see in this story is the thing that I mentioned at the very beginning. Jesus is the one that came to his town. He was not hiding. 
And he didn't even have to go all the way to his house to provide the healing that was needed. He sent a word. A word of assurance. And sometimes it can feel like God is so absent and so far. I want you to hear within this story, it simply took a word from Jesus to provide the healing that was asked for. And what do we have in the word? Well, we've got... We've got the word of God that declares his promises for us each and every day. That you are his child and you are forgiven. That by his stripes you are healed. That he is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider for all of our needs. Every word of the text is meant to be a declaration to the requests of our life that my God is bigger and stronger and more capable to be all that I need and more. And in that I place my trust. And something that began up here, perhaps in a mental ascent of, it is, feels like Jesus is someone worth following. I wonder if today we can start to see that move to our hearts in real sense of trust. That even in this moment, you might recall and remember the ways that Jesus has shown up for you in your story. That you might humble yourself. And make sure that your heart does not move to a place of entitlement, but stays in that beautiful place of expectation. Expectation is the breeding ground of miracles. It's the space that we can enter into daily, trusting that God is who he says he will be. And then acting. For some of us, you hold a request, you hold a burden, and you have remembered, you have humbled yourself, and today is the day to act to make the request that sits on your heart. There's no request too little or too big for Jesus. He simply just wants to respond. <laughs>